Hello everybody, how are you? My name is Carolina Chavez. We are broadcasting live from Miami. Today is Wednesday, May 6, 2020. Um, today we're gonna talk about a few, a few themes. Uh, the first is um, the J. Crew that J. Crew applied for bankruptcy, filed for bankruptcy. Um, our second. Um, our second theme is going to be, we're, uh, we're going to give an update of, of how the companies have responded to the, to the pandemic in Bangladesh, paying orders or not paying orders. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're also going to talk about the brands that are having some advantage, uh, uh, brands that uh, do sustainable clothing versus the brands that um, produce uh, for the masses and also about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and their Redesign Jeans Initiative. So we're gonna start with um, J. Crew. The word J uh, bankruptcy comes from, give me one second, please. It comes from the word banca rota in Italian, rota with double T, that means a broken bench, right? It says that um, a few, the, that the bankers in long, long time ago, they worked on benches that were made of wood, and when they didn't pay their bills, the benches were broken. So that's why it's called banca rota or bankruptcy in, in English. This is a legend, so it's hard to, to really uh, be, uh, come with, um, with a, a true story about this, but it, it makes sense. So in, the, in the ancient Greece, this is way, way before. Uh, bank bankruptcy did, did not exist, but since then, it is registered how debts were taken care of. So in that era, it says that families, for example, if I got in debt, me, my, my partner, my husband, wife, my kids, even my, uh, the people that worked for me were taken into some type of slavery until five years, for, a, for periods of five years and until the debt was paid through labor. And um, many, many states, after that, in, in, in Greece, no, they applied the same, the same uh, um, practice, but some of them were not as respectful with, with the principles because the principles uh, said that their lives and their limbs were protected. So outside of this first, um, uh, let's say, record, in ancient Greece, these laws were not protected. So you might lose your life or you might lose some limb if, if the debt was not paid in time. Um, it says that the statute of bankrupts of 14, 1542, the year 1542, was the first statute under the English law dealing with bankruptcy or insolvency. Bankruptcy is also documented in East Asia in the times of uh, Genghis Khan. There's a, an oral law, a code of law that uh, mandated the death penalty for people that uh, became bankrupt three times. Okay, so that was a little bit more extreme. And also there's, uh, it, it is recorded in history that the failure of a nation to meet a bond or a payment um, was seen in many occasions. For example, uh, the King Philip II of Spain declared four state bankruptcies in 1557, 1560, the year 1575, and the year 1596. So it says that although the development of international capital markets was quite limited prior to the year, the year 1800, uh, it was uh, nevertheless cataloged that some uh, defaults made by countries were documented, like France, Portugal, 
Prussia, Spain, and the early Italian city-states. And also in the edge of Europe, we have Egypt, Egypt, Russia, and Turkey. So these also are histories of, of chronic default that are documented. So we're gonna, we're gonna mention the different, this is now, we come now to the loss of bankruptcy in the United States. There's uh, different chapters for which uh, to apply to bankruptcy, and it depends on whether you're an individual, whether you're a country, whether you are um, um, a company, and they all have different ways of solving the situation. So for individuals, uh, the chapter seven and chapter 13 uh, can be applied depending on their specific situations. Also municipalities like cities, towns, villages, taxing districts, and school districts may file under the chapter nine to reorganize. The chapter 12 provides debt relief to family farmers and fishermen. Businesses may apply for bankruptcy under the chapter seven to liquidate or chapter 11 to reorganize. And the bankruptcy, uh, chapter number 15, uh, applies to involved parties for more of more than one country. So what is the chapter Jacob filed for is chapter number 11, which states that they uh, reorganize, they don't close operations, they don't liquidate, they don't disappear as a company, they reorganize their debt. Okay, of course, we're going to speak about why this is relevant for us as that we're speaking about sustainable fashion. Um, so it says that um, J. Crew owes between $1 billion to 10. The debt is huge. This means that they owe to over 2,500 creditors, according to its bankruptcy filing. So uh, there's a couple of things that are relevant here. It means that one, uh, among other things that uh, J. Crew is not gonna close their stores and that the company that leases all of their, their stores, they're gonna revaluate the, the, um, the leases to see how they can handle it. So this means that probably some of the stores will have to be closed because of the rearrangement of the debt, but the company is still going. The, 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 they're hoping that when these lockdowns from the pandemic open up, many of the stores are gonna reopen. So, but once again, and a big but over here, the weakest link is the most affected over here, okay? Um, I, I read um, the, the Mostafis Udin, the managing director of the Denim Expert Limited, and also the founder and CEO of the Bangladesh Denim Expo and Bangladesh Apparel Exchange, he gave a statement on May 1st about why this is so um, delicate, why this is a situation that is so not convenient for them, explaining that if a company goes uh, files for bankruptcy, it means they're not doing good business. So why give them a second opportunity by rearranging, by, you know, uh, bringing the debt into, you know, into other terms and doing all these things? And the problem is that um, the, the factories that they owe money to, they're not paid. Usually, and this is very complex, of course, uh, the, there's governments involved and, 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 and equity companies, and there, it, it is very complex, but what pertains to the, these factories in Bangladesh is that when a company goes into bankruptcy or, or uh, rearrangement, <clears throat> remember that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, these factories are subcontracted. They're not part of the day-by-day -day payroll, they don't, um, they're not employees, these factories just don't belong to the, the companies. So in most of the cases, they 
don't see any of these payments being done to them. And um, he gave this statement that says, there has to be a better way than this. I understand the issue of bankruptcy and I appreciate that we have to create a climate where business people are prepared to take risks. But there is a huge difference between genuine entrepreneurialism and risk taking and rank opportunism on people playing the system. Okay, so this is not, he's not talking about J. Crew right now. I'm guessing he gave this statement because uh, J. Crew filed for bankruptcy. He's talking about other companies. So what happens? They file for bankruptcy, their debt gets um, rearranged, and then they don't pay for, for orders that were made. Companies go through their process and then reorder again from these factories in the other side of the world. Or, or This is not a problem exclusive of Bangladesh or Asia, but you know, these, these factories, they depend mostly uh, on these huge uh, companies. So the problem for them is that when they go to bankruptcy, they stop paying all these people and it's lawful, right? And then they get back on their track, they make another order, and it's extremely risky for these factories to take in more orders from companies that were already on a track of of bankruptcy that, that they were not having good practices business wise so on the on the side of the of the factories they don't have much choice because you would say well they can choose to accept orders or to have these clients or not well yes but because they depends so much this is this is uh, bangladesh specifically specifically it's a country that 70 percent of their exports are from the uh, textile industry so really most of the income most of what makes the country go becomes uh, it, it is it is uh, the garment industry right so it is really not a, 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 a a very big option that they have no to to pick and choose what clients do they want to to work with we we spoke about last week with about walmart um whatever they 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 want to have walmart as a client of course walmart one of the biggest corporations in the world of course they they are it's in their best interest to have to have these companies as clients so um we will see what happens. Uh, hopefully this doesn't affect Bangladesh and, and all of these workers and factories. But, you know, these, these ways of handling uh, bankruptcy in the United States is, is in the least beneficial to all, of these, to all of these factories. Another thing I wanted to mention is that J. Crew has a lot of uh, literature on their website about sustainability about uh, garment workers, empowerment, about renew uh, renewable energy, recycling of water. So um, I, th I would like to explore a little bit more on this because as I said last week also, it is not only mentioning this, they really have to follow through. It's not jumping on the wagon on the marketing that right now is talking about sustainability, but really applying all these um, principles to what they do and their supply chain is just as complicated and intrinsic as any other big company not as walmart i want to think because walmart is huge but it, it is also a, um, a very big structure so we will we will explore more on that um also i have a an article from wwd uh, it's a, the, an English, an, a publication in English that uh, it reads the Bangladesh factory workers still need to be paid, but brands say they are working on it. So it refers a little bit to what I was just saying. We spoke also about it last week when we talked about, uh, we've been talking about it for, for a couple of weeks because when the pandemic started, 
ca uh, orders were canceled. I'm going to uh, tell you a little a brief uh, background of what we've been talking about. A lot of companies canceled orders that came from uh, uh, countries in, in Asia. Until last week, it was already an amount of $6 billion dollars of canceled orders, okay? So after a month, this article that I'm talking to you about, after a month of, um, of the campaign that Remake launched, uh, that's, that's called Pay Up, it's a hashtag that says Pay Up, that they're asking companies that canceled orders to pay, no? Um, The organizers claimed on Monday that 13 companies have yet to pay factory workers in Bangladesh who lost wages during um, during the, this period of time due to canceled orders. But some of the companies like CNA, Walmart, Mother Care, and Best Seller denied uh, remakes allegations and insisted that they are honoring their commitments. Last month, the nonprofit remake claim that more than 50 million international garment workers are being affected negatively by the fallout from the pandemic. This is all over the world, in the United States, in Latin America, of course, in all of these countries in Asia. So this is 50 million international garment workers, okay? So um, they, they started a petition since last month and as of monday there were more than 1200 people that signed that petition that is asking for companies to pay so in the past few months thousands of workers have been laid off of, or furloughed the difference between laid off and furloughed is that furloughed is just temporary right they they, they they're let go but they still have their jobs to come back to. When they are laid off, they're just, they're not gonna come back. I mean, they might come back, but they need to apply again for, uh, for a job, etc. That's, that's the, the difference. Um, so these are the brands that the organization is claiming that they haven't paid, okay? I have a few here that says uh, Gap, Primark, CNA, Mother Care, Bestseller, Coles, Walmart, ASDA, uh, JCPenney, Urban Outfitters, Free People, Anthropology, Arcadia, which uh, owns Burton, Topshop, and other brands, ASOS, American Eagle, Outfitters, and Under Armour. Remember uh, what we spoke about it last week? Walmart, they are paying their orders. I, I got that, confirma that information confirmed from um, Faisal Hamad, which uh, we had an interview with him. He, he has companies in Bangladesh, and he's also the, v, the vice president of a company that protects the workers' rights, okay? So he confirmed to me that Walmart is paying for, uh, for the orders that they were made already, but Walmart has a company in the UK that's called ASDA, And for us that they haven't paid, okay, so um, we're talking about Bangladesh, only in Bangladesh, it has around 5,000 factories and that employ 4.1 million garment workers. So this is to give us uh, the magnitude, okay, we're not talking about 100 employees, no, this is almost the entire country. And many, many of these uh, um, workers are single mothers. So, you know, Faisal, Faisal Samad talked to us about how important it is for, for, for the industry that <clears throat> to keep going in a healthy way because of the reason that it employs so many women. Women are empowered, this force in the country It's empowered, they can bring money to their homes, they can give education to their children, they have a chance of a better life. So about 4.1 million workers, mostly women and uh, single moms. So to determine which companies were uh, complying with, with their promises, 
remake spoke with representatives from the AWAC Foundation, the Bangladesh Garment Workers Manufacturers, and the Exporters Association, and the microfinance opportunities. So she, um, the founder of AWAC, Anasma Actor, estimated that 71% of the garment workers, as I said, uh, many of whom are single mothers, they are being paid, okay? Uh, she says that without the workers, there's, there's just not, not dresses to make. The industry just doesn't, doesn't function at all. Um, so some of, the, some, of the, um, some of the companies that Remake spoke with, they made some statements. For example, um, <clears throat> Walmart says that they estimate that the exception will amount to less than 2% of its annual private brand apparel orders in Bangladesh. So they are committing the parts that are not yet fulfilled it, it, it comes to a 2% of, its, uh, of, of their commitment annually. So it's really, for Walmart, maybe not such a big number. For, for Bangladesh, that we, have, we will have to see. But at least they are in communication, which is, which is positive, and they are, they are taking their orders. They are paying for their orders. Let's remember that <clears throat> when, they ca uh, when they make an order, it takes two, three months for big companies to pay for those orders. So if they are left without those payments, the factories that they took care already of the cost of those orders, imagine they are left completely with nothing. Plus, there are not new orders coming because there's a pandemic going on. So right now, these companies are canceling orders because let's say, they're going to bring clothes for the spring season and their spring season is over because everything, I mean, it's over because stores are closed and we don't know when they're going to open. They're not selling the season, right? So they, they cannot or they are not uh, doing more orders because they don't know when and what, according to their seasons, are going to be able to sell their clothes. So that's a that's a <clears throat> another issue that the, that the orders are not are not coming in the next orders so um another brand mother care the spokes the spokeswoman of mother brand says that we have been working very closely with our manufacturing and franchise partners since the beginning of the crisis to mitigate the impact on their businesses during these unprecedented times, we will continue to do so. These are, these are the brands that are coming um, to speak with Remake, okay? Also, the, uh, a spokesman for Bestseller disputed is ranking explaining that Bestseller is committed to accept the delivery of orders that have already been made and to those that are in production through individual dialogue with all suppliers. So um, they say that um, they are taking their orders. Remix says, because this is how it works. The, the period of time, for example, I order right now, but they're gonna give my orders in three, we in three months, right? They're gonna, they're, me as a, as a big company here in, in the West, I ordered something, but I haven't paid yet right because the order is not coming so some of these companies that are marked as not paying is not because they're not complying but because of the timing but they are working in compliance with their the factories over there and the times on the other side uh well i have um <clears throat> 13 brands that have bowed to pay uh, this is a statement by Remake, and uh, the, that they are in good favor. This means that they did pay or are in good standing. Brands like H&M, Sara, Inditex, uh, Timberland, The North Face, Vans, Dickies, Tommy Hilfiger, Calvin Klein, Target, Marks and Spencer, Adidas, Nike, Uniqlo, Texco, and Next. 
The Bangladesh garment industry accounts for 80% of the country's exports, as I said, with many workers' livelihoods uh, reliant on apparel orders from the US and Europe. As is the case around the world, many apparel factories in Bangladesh have ground to a halt because of COVID-19. Um, an estimated thir three billion worth of orders have been canceled of, or paused. This uh, remake said it on Monday. I spoke uh, last week with Faisal Samad. He said it was six billion in, in US dollars that have been canceled. So we will keep you updated in this situation. There's a petition, as I said, that we can sign. Um, I always send an email with all the resources that, uh, you know, of, of what we talk about during the broadcast and resources and links for more information. So um, I'll send this petition. I don't, I, I'll put it online. Maybe you can find it before, before next week to help because sometimes we don't know how to do. Well, maybe if more and more people are signing up this petition, we can pressure all these companies to, to take these commitments. So um, on another news, um, I'm exploring this article from the business of fashion that says green brands have a head start on fashion's post-pandemic recovery. Coronavirus have, have forced the lockdowns uh, giant uh, brands such as Primark, H&M, Zara, to shut down thousands of stores and cancel orders worth millions of dollars. In the coming months, the fashion industry will face a very big shakeout that will put 80% of companies in Europe and the, in the U.S. in financial distress, according to a McKinsey report that came out on April. Yet, one corner of the business is thriving. And this is uh, the sustainable fashion business. Why? We have a statement from Cora Hills, founder and chief executive office officer of Rev and Bert. This is a platform that sells luxury fashion focused on su su sustainability. She says, we are doing better this month than we did during Christmas. People are shopping more online and have more time to make conscious decisions. Our designers have greater control over the supply chain because it's very difficult to produce abroad and be sustainable. So there is an aspect here that's uh, worth um, exploring, mentioning. It says higher prices and a smaller scale have traditionally kept sustainable fashion brands outside the mainstream, okay? Now these same attributes might save them from the wave of consolidation or insolvencies that's coming for fast fashion and luxury household brands. What does this mean? High prices and smaller scale. This is how uh, some sustainable fashion brands operate because Products are more expensive because they're sustainable. This doesn't mean all of the sustainable brands are expensive, okay? It just means that because the supply chain, because everything is done with much more care and more, the supply chain is traceable and everything is more local and everything is more clean, right? The prices go up. They don't produce, they don't mass produce. Okay, this, this means that their scale is smaller, meaning these brands that don't have the buying power as these huge companies, they cannot make million dollar orders, which is not a bad thing because those million or dollar orders are made with very bad quality, um, in, in very uh, precarious situations, from environmental aspects to uh, social aspects, etc. So these two factors of higher prices and smaller scale are now benefiting social, um, sustainable, responsible brands because they can still produce more organically 
uh, as opposed to bigger brands. What does this mean? They have the person that produces their cotton closer to them. They know that the person that produces buttons, they're still working or not. You know, the traceability, the transparency is all, is all about that. Knowing, knowing that all of the elements that contain a piece of clothing, uh, you know where they're coming from. And many, many of these big brands, they don't even know. They know where this, for example, is coming from, but they don't know where the elements come from. So these, uh, these elements are giving um, <clears throat> an advantage to smaller companies that, that um, produce sustainable, uh, responsible fashion. Also because it says that large retailers source textiles to third parties in developing nat nations so, such as China, Vietnam, or Bangladesh. And um, a designer, uh, it says, Kirsi Ninimaki, a designer professor at Aalto University in Finland, says these elements are often made to underpaid, by underpaid workers operating old energy intensive machi machinery treated with polluting chemicals banned in developed countries. So we have another issue over here. We wear things that are made with chemicals that are banned in this country, for example. So when you have a supply chain and the capability of traceability, of knowing that you have organic cotton and is certified, or that you're recycling from uh, this and that material. When you know all of this, then you choose not to uh, buy from a factory that's using chemicals that are not only harmful for the people that wear the clothes, but also harmful for the workers that are handling these chemicals, right? She says that uh, shorter supply chains allow for more transparency and that most, uh, for most brands, we still don't know where things are produced, using which chemicals and what waste comes out. That's quite problematic for the, for the fashion industry in general. <clears throat> so she, co uh, Ninimaki, co-authored co a scientific review published in Nature earlier this year showing that the sector produces about 20% of the world's waste water. 20% of the water that's polluted, it's produced by the fashion industry, all right? Mainly through treating or dyeing fabric. And these plastic microfibers used in many garments release the equivalent of 50 billion plastic bottles into the oceans each year. The rise, of, the rise of fast fashion, which depends on shoppers buying cheap items frequently, only makes things worse. At a time when, only, when even oil uh, companies are trying to cut greenhouse gas emissions, those from the fashion industry are expected to surge by more than 50% by 2030. In 10 years, this is going to increase by 50%. The solution is to transition to slow fashion, to a slow fashion model, um, which means that we buy in a different way, in every possible way. We buy out of, um, out of a need instead of an impulse. We buy products that are responsible in different aspects, like uh, that they don't come from animals, that they don't use chemicals, that they don't harm other people while doing these products. There's no child work involved, there's no etc. There's so many aspects to it, but that's what the slow fashion um, movement is about, right? Uh, the European Union is still drafting economic recovery plans, but policymakers in several nations are already calling for measures that push for shorter supply chains to ensure 
manufacturing of critical components in the region. Stimulus packages targeting local and small companies, uh, local, small, and medium companies could disproportionately affect green fashion businesses, Ninimaki said, giving them a further leg up in the future economic recovery. She says that uh, stimulus packages should be going to small companies who are operating in an ethical way. It would be good to assign funds to companies who are producing sustainably, employing teams of conscious and skilled workers and are operating locally. So what's happening right now with all this crisis, companies, medium and bigger companies are getting stimulus packages from the governments. Um, but what she's saying is that the, 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 we, we forget about the subcontractors, we forget about the micro uh, uh, um, businesses, we forget about the people that are informal, um, have informal uh, jobs like um, artisans and a lot of these people that are not protected under, under these laws. They're not protected and they should because what they're doing is responsible in so many ways, right? They're contributing to, to their own little economies instead of making, you know, a, a, a two or three people in, at the top of the chain rich. No, they, 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 these people, they bring back to their, econo to their communities. Their, their work uh, generates um, healthier conditions to live, they, they generate education in some cases, they generate, they, they're not harmful for the environment, they use the materials that they have around, this is locally producing. So uh, it, it, they're, they're asking to, to, for companies to fund all of these very, very small businesses. So the, fa uh, so the fashion industry uh, really, really can, can transform, right? We, we've seen before in other crises that while the crisis lasts, our uh, consumerism changes. One, because we are affected financially. The other, because it doesn't look so ethical that we're spending too much when there's a crisis going on. So we change our behavior. But it's also been seen that after the crisis, we start doing it all over again, right? We, we start uh, with our same good old habits of con consumption and it really doesn't change much right now. Um, I think we are in, in, in an era where, I, I don't think, I know and we all know that we are in an era of a climate crisis and that is probably one of the imperatives, if not the biggest. So all of these things that have been, uh, the, the fashion industry has, has been asking the sustainable fashion industry has been asking to change right now. In some cases, it has changed, but what is being expected is that this behavior continues, right? One of the advantages of this behavior to continue is that, for example, we're not going to be shipping from the other side of the world garments that just uh, shipping causes a lot of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So imagine if, if really as a practice, as a business model, we have these supply chains closer to us, then a lot of gas emissions would be reduced only from the shipping. So, um, the, the article says that transparency is a very big struggle for the brands, which often don't know where their products are at any given time. Uh, uh, Niall Murphy, the chief executive officer of everything, uh, <clears throat> that's a platform providing product uh, tracing and analytics services to fashion firms, 
says that the pandemic exacerbated this problem, the transparency, the transparency problem, okay? If, if you don't know where your buttons are coming from and you don't know if the factory that's producing those buttons is closed, then you have a big problem, but then you know about this problem way after you could do anything about it. You, right? I mean, in, 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 as opposed to having a supply chain that's right here next to you, then you have control, you know, because you always knew. You always had this information available to you. So this pandemic only exacerbated these issues. I've been mentioning this about uh, this aspect that uh, all of the problems that were many companies were facing right now, they just they're in their faces. They're just, you know, as bigger as ever. So uh, among its conclusions from the McKinsey report, they said that the post virus supply chains will have to shrink to avoid essential products being stranded for months in distant ports in case of a new virus outbreak or lockdowns. That should reduce emissions from transport and improve environmental control over factories. Most fashion brands are now completely paralyzed because of this, uh, all of these uh, lockdowns and they're addressing these issues and ful fulfilling pre-pandemic environmental commitments will probably, well, that's the hope, uh, become part of the strategic, um, uh, you know, of the strate strategy after economies and shops and everything else reopen. <clears throat> but some, because exactly what the pandemic is bringing, are being forced to do, right? Um, so, <clears throat> right now, everything is at a halt. People are just trying to get through this, uh, but this is a corrector for the industry that will push us to think differently. It will put sustainability on top of everyone's minds. Okay, this is, there's, there's uh, these aspects also of wanting to have things that are made with uh, material that it doesn't contaminate, that doesn't hold dirt. You know, there's, there's so many issues that the fashion industry right now has the opportunity to shift. And I think us as consumers are pushing in, in, in certain level to change this because we are online, because we are taking care of a little, we're not consuming as, you know, as an impulse, we are we are really spending our money if we are spending money on things that are more valuable in in many aspects. Not not just going to the store and getting everything we can and then returning and then throwing away. Hopefully, this is going to change. Um, we have a, a we got news from the from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation, their principle is circular economy. So in a very brief um, explanation, the circular economy is as opposed to a linear economy that is, uh, like the linear economy is uh, take, uh, use, and dispose. The circular economy is, um, its principle is to not to produce another raw material, but you have already something done and then extend the life of this product. And then when the life of this product ends, you transform it into something else to extend again the life, right? Instead of, of, of producing raw materials from zero, which we know waste so much of our natural resources and then throwing it away, at a very, you know, having it a, a very short lifespan and the throwing away also contributes to so much pollution. So the circular economy is, is this concept of, of not um, throwing away. So um, they, they launched this jeans redesign uh, program and they just announced that 17 more brands sign up to the jeans redesign. Um, so basically the guidelines for this are uh, the health, safety and rights of people involved in all parts of the fashion industry as a prerequisite, along with working conditions and improvement in factories, uh, the manufacturing globally. So um, 
what they need to do, the brands that are that want to be part of this, is uh, one of those things is to put on their labels that they are part of this um, initiative, and uh, the um, the aspects that they have to comply with are durability, which means that the genes <clears throat> can last. Imagine can last more minimum thirty home laundries. So this means there are genes, genes that last forever, no? Genes that you can buy and they last even less than 30, 30 home laundries. Um, material health, which is which talk, talks about um, uh, the, the, for example, may, uh, genes made of cellulose fibers from regenerative organic or transitional farming methods. So um, free of hazardous chemicals and conventional uh, electro, electro plating and uh, some like sandblasting some processes like sandblasting stone fishing all of these things are prohibited or also recyclability traceability and um, and as I said the genes redesign logo has to uh, has the, I mean the, the label has to have also the instructions <coughs> of how to take care of this of this article. So some of the brands that joined are Banana Republic, uh, Organic Basics. These are brands, uh, also garment manufacturers, Remy Holdings, Tarasami Apparels, the Fabric Mills and Laundries, which are artistic fabric mills, Crescent Bauman, Green Lab, etc. All of these I'm gonna put on an email that I'm gonna send next week, so subscribe um, to my page. The information, I'm gonna show it to you later. And um, as my last note, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is launching a circular economy course via Zoom for teenagers starting tomorrow. I believe it's going to last seven weeks. So if you want more information, I can provide it to you. Uh, I think this is incredible and super nice because we need education. To, in order to change all this, we need to understand first why we should change all of this cycle of of disposing of things so thank you so much everybody for joining me i will be seeing you soon uh, next next wednesday at 1 p.m in english and uh in spanish at 12. okay so take care i will be seeing you soon thank you